Hello, welcome back to Daily Dose of Frost Language and also welcome back to the part 2 of this series where we look at lifetimes in Rust in the Rust programming language. Now, yesterday we took a look at the concept of lifetime in Rust and then explored a few examples to show how it manifests itself. Now today, we are going to take a look at a few things. First, how to use lifetime in strokes and when to use them. Then we take a look at how to use it in implementation blocks as well. Then we look at the static lifetime in Rust. And then very importantly, we are going to look at the elision rule in Rust. And that is how Rust determines when to ask for a lifetime for references and when not to ask for a lifetime for references. Okay, so first, let's see how to use lifetimes in a struct. Let's say we have a struct called users. Now user will have a name and then a last name. Now pay attention to this. We deliberately decided to accept a string slice for each first name, for the first name and the last name. And immediately Rust will start telling us that there, there are a few errors here. And if you hover over this array to say missing lifetime specifier, expected named lifetime parameter. Now, but what if we changed this to a string instead? That error will be gone and Rust is no longer talking about lifetimes. So why then was Rust asking us about lifetimes when we used references? Well, that is because we've defined that whenever someone uses this struct for the first name and the last name, they will have to pass a reference of a string slice. Quiz simply means Rust, we need to know how long these references will live in order to make sure that they will live as long as the struct instance itself will live. Now, all we have to do in here is to come along and give a lifetime. Using the lifetime annotation, we can then say that first name is going to live as long as that lifetime. And then second name, the last name is going to live as long as the same lifetime as well. Now, Rust will start monitoring to make sure that whoever is getting an instance of this user struct must have both the first name and the last name live the same time. To show you an example, so now we have a user called user1 which holds an instance of this user struct and inside another scope we created this last name variable and then we decided to instantiate this struct. Now uh, the Rust analyzer is now pointing out that the last name does not live long enough. Borrowed value doesn't li live long enough and that is simply because when we're defining the struct, we've specified using this uh, generic lifetime parameter that the first name must live as long as the last name since they are all going to be references. And that is why it's preventing us from using it, from doing something like this because clearly speaking, first name will live long, longer than last name. At the end of this scope, the last name variable will be dropped, but first name will live longer till at this point you are using it. Now quickly, let's look at how to use lifetime generic parameters in methods and implementation blocks. So let's just get rid of this. Let's say we want to create a method called get first name for this struct. So we we'll use the implementation keyword as well and then for the user and then we'll create a function get first name. To make it a method, we we'll use the self parameter and then we want it to return something okay it's going to return self dot first name okay so first now you find out that trust will be warning us and it to say implicit a little lifetime not allowed here yes we need to introduce this lifetime specifier as well and just like when, what we saw earlier when we treated generics you have to make that lifetime available here and then we we'll use it here very important okay and then right here we can now define that this return is a string okay but the string is going to return we live as long as the life parameter a so this way we are able to return the first name inside this method so pay attention that we have to make the lifeline annotation available here 
and then we'll have to make it available we can then use it right here and every other places as well so rust considers two types of lifetime the input lifetime which for example for this method is self right here and then the output lifetime which is what, what we specified right here and using the illusion rule that is how rust determines how to implicitly assign lifeline parameters in rust and this is what i mean let's say we have this function that we call name that we call print name and then you pass a name and the name is going to be a string slice okay we're going to print a name and also return that name as well all we have to do in here is to return the name and then maybe we print that to the terminal as well now notice that ross is not demanding anything about lifetime for us from us right and that is because and in order to understand why ross demands for lifetime annotation in some cases and not in other cases you have to understand the rules there are three illusion rules that rust uses to determine when to ask for lifetimes and when not to so here are the three rules the first one is the compiler assigns a lifetime parameter to each parameter that's a reference so in other words a function with one reference we get one lifetime parameter and a function with two reference with two parameters will get two separate lifetime parameters now judging by the first rule right here we have one parameter okay and since it is a reference rust will implicitly assign a lifetime to it without even without us needing to do that so rust will do something like this okay implicitly without us needing to do it and then so this is equivalent to what we just wrote but to make things a lot easier in rust this will be a lot verbose and so rust has dropped it in fact uh, prior to version one of rust language if you are going to pass a reference even if it's just one parameter you must spe provide a specifier to it so but as people has continued to use the rust language they found out that the compiler can just do this for us so if you are passing one value if you're passing one parameter rust will automatically assign one lifetime to it now if you have another parameter right here as well okay rust will also assign another parameter to it assign another lifetime parameter to it this way but you don't need to do that yourself this way so now we have two lifetime parameters but this is not the only rule it uses now the second rule says if there is exactly one input lifetime parameter that lifetime is assigned to all output lifetime parameters so if we have just one lifetime right here like we did you can see that we have two lifetimes right here you can see that we have two parameters right here and that is why rust is asking us to consider using one of the available lifetimes here so the rust compiler is concerned about the output lifetime of this function now however if we if this function accepts just one parameter rust is not going to worry about that because implicitly judging by this second rule if there is exactly one input lifetime parameter then one lifetime is assigned to all the output lifetime parameters so implicitly rust has assigned this same lifetime parameter to this output i remember it's going to do that automatically so we don't even need to do it you can just remove this and there won't be any problems now thirdly this is for method so the third rule is for methods so it says if there are multiple input lifetime parameters but one of them is a self a reference to self or a mutable reference to self which means implicitly it's going to be a method the lifetime of self is assigned to all output lifetime parameters which makes sense okay so it's similar to this second rule except that this is just for methods and unlike the second rule we are each will assign the input lifetime parameter to the output lifetime parameter for only functions that accept one exactly one input lifetime parameter rust we do it for for methods even if they accept multiple lifetime parameters as long as it is a method which means the first parameter will be a reference to self or a reference a mutable reference to self so that is why here rust is not concerned about 
the lifetime of the return value because it will assign it itself but once you provide a second one like name 2 and it's gonna be a string loss loss will now be consigned about the return type the lifetime of the return type and in order to fix it we do we we'll do the same thing we did by providing the lifetime ourselves because trust cannot figure it out on its own if we want both of them to live at the same time then we can just provide that and then also provide it right here and us to be happy so simply put what Ross does is it tries its best to assign these lifetime parameters for us but if it can't judging by these three rules Rust will now demand that we provide that ourselves in fact as you can see in this example to justify this third rule you can see that here let's say this also accepts this method also accepts another parameter called name which is going to be a string slice as well and even another one name 3 which is going to be a string slice as well okay, you can see that Ross is not even asking us about the output lifetime parameter because it will assume that the output lifetime parameter will match the lifetime parameter of self itself okay and that is what it says here if there are multiple input lifetime parameters but one of them is self or a mutable reference of self which makes it a method then the lifetime of self is assigned to all output lifetime parameters okay so this is in nutshell what the illusion rule is and this is how Ross implicitly decides on whether to assign lifetimes by itself or as the developer to provide it now now that we've seen this let's take a look at the static lifetime parameter now just like we treated treated in the previous video when we talked about data types in rust which you can check in the description there is a static type in rust and for static types and constants rust will store them in the binary to demonstrate that let's say we have this function right called add and then for some reason we decide to return a string reference right here okay now we can go along and then return something now we have this function called add okay we are just simply returning a strong slice right here but if you hover over this trust you say missing lifetime specifier okay now and right here we are not even accepting any parameter as well so we can go ahead and provide a generic lifetime parameter right here and rust will be happy right but since you are 100% sure that we are returning a string slice that will be stored in the binary right here okay we can simply tell rust that the return value will be a static value by simply stating that using this static lifetime parameter okay so we can now get rid of this lifetime annotation and here we are telling Ross that the string slice that we're going to be returning right here will be stored statically in the binary okay so instead of providing a generic lifetime parameter right here and using it right here we are sure it's going to be stored in the binary and therefore we can now use this static lifetime parameter to return it this will just tell us that okay whatever is returned by this function will be available everywhere in the code so it doesn't have to worry about the lifetimes as well but don't make the mistake of doing it everywhere for example right here you might be tempted to go to this print name function and then specify that it's going to return that the output lifetime is going to be static but it's not a good idea because this name and this name might live might not be static so only use it when you know explicitly that what is returned will be totally static okay and now finally let's look at how to use both generics and lifetimes in the same place now if you look very closely if you are very observant you notice that if we used generics in this function we'll be defining it in the same place it looks like they are the same place okay let's say let's assume that name itself will be a generic okay it will be a generic parameter so all we have to do is to come in here and then define it as well so we define both lifetime parameters and generic parameters in the same place so if you find yourself in a situation where you want to use generics and also lifetimes just go ahead and use them here right 
and that won't be a problem. Now, of course, you can see that Ross is now warning us that T doesn't implement the standard format display because we want to print it here. So we can also go ahead, like just like we saw in the previous video, where we treated threads in Rust. You can now use the where clause to define that T will implement the display thread. Okay, and that will make Rust happy. And then for the return type, we also define that what will be returned will be type of T. So you can use generics. So in summary, you can use both generics and lifetime parameters in the same angle brackets when you are defining them. Okay, so guys, thanks for watching. Make sure you like the video and subscribe. And then in the next path, which is the final part of this series, the past three, we are going to take a look at questions people have around the world about the Rust program, about lifetimes in Rust in the Rust programming language. And then we're going to treat many of them. So make sure you like the video and subscribe as that helps us out a lot. Thank you.